What if we say that black people living in the United States should not trust the healthcare system? This might seem an old opinion, but the truth is that black history shows the reasons. From experimenting and not treating black men with syphilis to seeing the impacts of digging black people's graves to experiment on them, a lot has been hidden from you. Most people believe that black people only saw racism and discrimination in the economy and society, but they don't know that scientific and medical racism is more disturbing. So, what was done to black people which makes us doubt the present-day healthcare system? Let's find out. The Black History Archives Beginning in 1932, 600 African-American men from Macon County, Alabama, were enlisted to take part in a scientific experiment on cephalus. Dubbed the Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male, the study was conducted by the United States Public Health Service. It involved blood tests, x-rays, spinal taps, and autopsies of the subjects. More and more black men wanted to participate in the study, thinking it could save them from diseases. However, they did not know the ulterior motives behind the study. In reality, the goal was to observe the natural history of untreated syphilis in black populations. However, the subjects were unaware of this and were simply told they were receiving treatment for bad blood. In reality, they received no treatment at all. Even after penicillin was discovered as a safe and reliable cure for syphilis, the majority of men did not receive it. But to really understand the heinous nature of the Tuskegee experiment, one needs some societal context, a deep understanding of history, and a realization of just how many opportunities government agencies had to halt this human experimentation, but chose not to. In 1865, the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution officially ended the enslavement of black Americans. However, by the early 20th century, the cultural and medical landscape of the U.S. was still steeped in racist concepts. Social Darwinism was on the rise, based on the survival of the fittest and scientific racism was prevalent. Many white people already considered themselves superior to blacks, and science and medicine were all too eager to reinforce this hierarchy. Before the abolition of slavery, scientific racism was used to justify the African slave trade. Scientists argued that African men were uniquely fit for enslavement due to their physical strength and simple minds. The notion was that slaves had primitive nervous systems, so they did not experience pain as white people did. Enslaved African Americans in the South were claimed to suffer from mental illness at lower rates than their freed Northern counterparts, thus proving that enslavement was beneficial for them. During and after the American Civil War, African Americans were depicted as a different species from white Americans, and mixed-race children were presumed to be prone to many medical issues. Doctors of the time testified that the emancipation of slaves had caused the mental, moral, and physical deterioration of the black population, observing that virtually free of disease as slaves, they were now overwhelmed by it. Many believed that African Americans were doomed to extinction, and arguments were made about their physiology being unsuited for the colder climates of America, suggesting they should be returned to Africa. This was the society black African Americans were living in, and it was no surprise that they were facing racism of all forms. Scientific and medical authorities of the late 19th and early 20th centuries held extremely harmful pseudoscientific ideas, specifically about the sex drives and genitals of African Americans. It was widely believed that, while the brains of African Americans were under-evolved, their genitals were overdeveloped. Black men were seen to have an inherent perversion for white women, and all African Americans were perceived as inherently immoral, with insatiable sexual appetites. This is significant because it was these distorted ideas about race, sexuality, and health that guided the researchers in carrying out the Tuskegee study. Their fundamentally flawed scientific understanding led them to believe that black people as a whole were highly susceptible to sexually transmitted infections like syphilis. Another misguided belief was that all black individuals, regardless of their education, background, economic status, or personal circumstances, could not be convinced to seek treatment for syphilis. This misconception allowed the U.S. Public Health Service to justify the Tuskegee study as a study in nature, rather than an experiment. 
It was ostensibly designed to observe the natural progression of cephalus within a community deemed unlikely to seek treatment. Here's a reminder to please support us so we can make more videos for you by subscribing to our channel and giving the video a like. We want to build a strong community and we need your support. Let's continue now. In 1933, the study was extended with 200 plus control patients without syphilis recruited. All patients were given ineffective medicines to reinforce the belief that they were being treated. Researchers actively ensured that their subjects did not receive treatment for syphilis on multiple occasions. In 1934, they requested doctors not to treat their subjects, and in 1940, they did the same with the Alabama Health Department. When many men were drafted in 1941, their syphilis was uncovered during the entrance medical exam. Rather than allowing treatment, the researchers had the men removed from the army. It became evident that the Tuskegee study deviated from its original plan of observing the natural progression of cephalus. The researchers lied to the participants about receiving treatment and actively prevented them from seeking life-saving treatment. The initial assumption that the people of Macon County would not seek treatment became a self-fulfilling prophecy. By 1952, about 30% of the participants had received penicillin despite the researchers' efforts. However, the USPHS argued that their participants, all black men, wouldn't seek penicillin or adhere to prescribed treatment plans, claiming they were too stoic to visit a doctor. In reality, these men believed they were already being treated, leading to a lack of motivation to seek additional treatment. The researchers' stance evolved over time. In 1965, they argued that it was too late to administer penicillin to the subjects, claiming that their syphilis had progressed too far for the drug to be effective. While a convenient justification for continuing the study, it's worth noting that penicillin is, and was, recommended for all stages of syphilis and could have halted the disease's progression in the patients. The Tuskegee study persisted until November 16, 1972, when a whistleblower, Peter Buxton, leaked information to the New York Times, leading to its front-page publication. By this time, only 74 test subjects remained alive. 128 patients had succumbed to syphilis or its complications, 40 wives had been infected, and 19 children had acquired congenital syphilis. Public outrage followed, with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People launching a class-action lawsuit against the USPHS. The suit was settled two years later for $10 million, with an agreement to cover the medical treatments of all surviving participants and infected family members, the last of whom passed away in 2009. However, these experiments were not limited to men only. In a case exposing the exploitation of a black woman dating back to the 1950s and spanning 70 years, Thermo Fisher Scientific Incorporation has reached a settlement in a lawsuit filed by the estate of Henrietta Lacks against the biotech firm for its involvement in what the legal action deemed a racially unjust medical system. In 1951, Lacks was diagnosed with cervical cancer at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, one of the few hospitals in the area that treated African Americans at that time. During her treatment, a sample of her cancer cells was taken without her knowledge or consent. The lawsuit accused Thermo Fisher of unjust enrichment and illegal profiting from Lack's genetic material, stating, Black's suffering has fueled innumerable medical progress and profit, without just compensation or recognition. Henrietta Lack's cells, known as HeLa cells, have significantly influenced medical science since their extraction in 1951. These cells have played a crucial role in the development of the polio vaccine, cancer research, studies on the effects of radiation and toxic substances, gene mapping, and various other scientific endeavors. But things don't end here. The 18th and 19th centuries ushered in a new approach to medicine, emphasizing increased anatomical knowledge and dissections. Consequently, the demand for cadavers or corpses surged, surpassing the available supply. Additionally, social attitudes toward the dissection and dismemberment of corpses were largely negative at the time, often viewed as punishment for the most heinous criminals. The solution then was grave robbing. Individuals would not only steal the bodies of deceased enslaved black individuals, but also take the corpses of black men, women, and children from their graves, selling them to medical schools. By the turn of the 18th century, 
the majority of New York City's dissection tables were populated with black bodies, despite the black community comprising only 15% of the population at the time. This practice was also widespread in Maryland and Virginia. In fact, Virginia Commonwealth University officially apologized for this practice in September 2022. What's more, from the 1950s through the 1970s, Philadelphia health officials allowed prominent researcher Dr. Albert M. Kligman to conduct hazardous experiments on incarcerated people, predominantly black individuals. Kligman intentionally exposed black men to dermatological, biochemical, and pharmaceutical experiments, including significant tests involving dioxin, the toxic chemical in the biochemical weapon Agent Orange that can even burn bones. While the city of Philadelphia and related institutions officially apologized in October 2022, the apology does not address the enduring scars and health impacts resulting from the experiments. But what's more tragic is that this practice is not confined to the past. Incarcerated individuals in Arkansas were administered a mix of drugs, including ivermectin, for COVID-19 treatment. It's crucial to note that ivermectin was not and has not been approved by the FDA for COVID-19 treatment. After experiencing a range of side effects, the men were informed that one of the drugs they received was ivermectin, a medication typically used for treating cows and horses. The abuse of black bodies within the incarcerated population didn't only impact men. Black women faced a different form of abuse and exploitation. They were often subjected to forced sterilization without their consent. Between 1909 and 1979, California forcibly and legally sterilized around 20,000 women, with the majority being black women and other women of color who were incarcerated or under state guardianship due to perceived incapacity. In North Carolina, sterilizations were also employed against black women in state institutions with the goal of weeding out any feeble-minded. What do you think? Can black people trust the healthcare system given that racism exists to this day. What should black people do to ensure they are not abused and experimented upon in the present day? In the comments section right below, let us know your thoughts on why this part of history is hidden from black people. Would you like us to make more videos? If yes, please support us by subscribing to the Black History Archives and clicking the bell icon. You can check out more videos on our channel too.